My name is Bob Harrison. Uh, I'm uh, Chair of Governors of Northern College uh, in Barnsley, uh, an outstanding uh, provider of further and adult education. In fact, it's just been given its second uh, outstanding rating by Ofsted with no areas for improvement, which I have to say has got absolutely nothing to do with me as Chair of Governors and has got everything to do with the quality of the teachers that we've got. Uh, you, 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 some of you may have listened to me before or heard me speak. You can follow me on Twitter, Bob Harrison Set, uh, and I'm always happy to converse with people. Uh, and you can get me on my website, Bob Harrison Set UK dot co dot UK. So that's me. In addition to chair of governors, I've worked all my life, 40 years in uh, secondary schools and further than adult and higher education. And at the moment, I'm currently uh, helping and advising uh, BIS, the government department, on the uh, strategic review of further education to ensure that digital technology is seen as a key transformative element in that. I must say it's a big challenge, that, because uh, trying to get people who don't think in the same, who think in the old paradigm of the industrial model of how teaching and learning should be, it's very difficult to get them to understand uh, what changes need to happen in terms of infrastructure and workforce skills to, to, to make FE fit for a more digital future. So that, that, that's me. I'm also the education advisor for Toshiba, uh, Northern Europe, and I've been that for 15 years now since I retired as a principal. I know I don't look that old, but there you go. That's, that's what Oil of You Lane will do for you. Uh, but I also want to like to introduce you to some of my family because one of the most proudest achievements is I'm a grandfather, and uh, these are some of my grandchildren. And uh, I, I do that and show you and share those with you, not, not just because I'm a proud grandfather, but because we need to set this conversation um, and actually, there are two more in addition to those, uh, Martin, uh, that have arrived within the last 18 months. So I, I need to update that photograph. But the reason I mentioned those as context for this discussion is that they will leave school in 2027, 2029, and 2030. The two most recent ones will leave in 2032 and 2033. The point, the point about you know me introducing you to my grandchildren is not just a personal point about something that I'm probably most proud of in my life and etc. But because of the implications that's got for all education, right? further education, uh, secondary schools, etc. etc. Now, uh, the pace of technological change that you and I have seen in the last 10 years would suggest uh, that the schools and colleges that they will be not only uh, progressing through, but will have an expectation of, um, are, are more likely to be uh, a much stronger digital infrastructure. They're going to be, we're talking about wearable computers, we're talking about uh, always on, anytime, uh, learning and assessment, uh, tutorial and teachers with a different set of workforce skills. I don't think they'll be in schools that will have desks facing forwards to a whiteboard, blackboard, chalkboard, or interactive board. Uh, I think they'll be used to screen-based and gesture-based uh, technologies. They'll be used to voice-to-text recognition and text-to-voice recognition. And you know, if that 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 is going to be where the educational institutions are, well, the rest of the world will be there, Martin. You know, we, we, all the things I just described are already happening now in other parts of our world, aren't we? You know, yeah. it's just because of the uh, constraints, the regulatory and, and accountability constraints that are placed on education that make it very difficult for teachers to innovate. Because teachers are scared to innovate. They're scared about what Ofsted will say. They're scared about whether the auditors will say, mm, well, because they weren't in the class, that's not real learning. You might have been supporting learning when they were, you know, at home or on the bus or anything like that. So th at the moment, there's a fear factor within, I think, all education. Uh, but, but, you know, in the area that you and I are more familiar with, further education, I think 
there's been far too much management and not enough leadership. There's been far too much focus on targets uh, of and and teaching, focus on teaching rather than focus on learning and learning outcomes. Um, and you have to blame the skills funding agency. You have to blame Ofqual. You have to blame Ofsted. And you know, if you want uh, really to get into all that, the, I can't recommend anything better than read the Feltag report because the Feltag report was the result of two years hard work, which aims to nudge the cultural inhibitors. And uh, daily, I get reports on Twitter uh, or Facebook or when I'm out and about speaking of uh, FE providers who have really embraced the spirit of it, you know, who didn't get distracted by the 10% thing, uh, you know, focused on the big picture and the big issue and said, yeah, this is a journey we need to start. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm really, really encouraged uh, that the, the uh, GISC have got are working with lots of colleges. That there's lots of FE providers who are engaging with this agenda and recognizing that, uh, the, the agile evolution, which uh, was which felt I aimed to bring about, the, the 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 government can't bring about agile evolution. The only people who can bring about agile evolution are the providers themselves, and they need to take ownership. And this was one of the one of the main thrusts of you know Feltag was that it wasn't a government top down policy. It was something that needed to be owned by the sector and the people. And, and my most famous tweet, which has been retweeted thousands and thousands of times now, is that those FE providers who embrace the spirit of Feltag will not only survive, but will thrive. And those that don't, won't. Now, that's been brought into even sharper focus within the last two months, two months. I mean, this is what, August now. Because... Uh, for, for, for the, particularly for those in FE, Martin, uh, people will know that the minister, the new minister, Nick Bowles, who came back, has decided to embark on a reform program of, to reshape the landscape of FE, uh, and that's all post-16, including sixth form colleges, uh, because at the moment uh, he is not convinced that the FE sector is fit for purpose to prepare young people and older people for employers' needs, for the, their own needs for the future and so on. And so there's a fairly radical reform agenda that has been being put through, put through by the government, which involves each local area, and these are called area review boards. So each local area, uh, is going to be have, have an area review board set up in the autumn term, which looks at existing provision uh, across. You know, let's let's take Manchester for example as a region, or Leeds. We could you know West York or something like that. Uh, 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 an overarching panel comes together, looks at all the existing and maps existing provision, and then maps that against what the employer needs are. Now you and I, as liberal educators, might say. Well, hang on a minute, it's not just about the needs of employers, but I think what we have to recognise is we've just had a Conservative government re-elected for a second term. They've got five years in power. They very much believe education. So what, what you and I believe and what they believe uh, might be two different things, but the agenda is a reshaping and a reformatting and a realignment of the FE landscape to make sure that it's much more acutely woven into what employer needs are. And, and they're changing all the time. And I mean, I, I don't know about your college, but uh, there are very few colleges in my experience, and I'm talking colleges now, not, I, I'm including work-based learning and adult and community learning providers. There are very few that I think have really tapped into the emerging and growing digital startup uh, you know, here in Manchester, I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of small SMEs, one person, two, three people. Uh, you know, you look at Shoreditch and, and what's going on down there. Now, to what extent is the FE providers that you and I have loved and grown up with part of that or not? I suspect they're not. And, and one of the ideas that I had, which 
resonated very well with the politicians and with the civil service was, well, you know, we've got this hideous situation where we've got these buildings, the big atriums and, 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 and lecture theatres and classrooms and teaching blocks and workshops that lie empty 50% of the year because, you know, they're closed down for holidays or whatever. And even then, when they're open, I would suggest the space utilisation is probably down about 40-50%, and that's only in the peak times between 9 o'clock in the morning and 4.30 in the afternoon. It's not beyond the wit of uh, college governors and principals to say, well, why don't we invite all the local digital startup companies to use our premises uh, and give them some free space and they can log on to our Wi-Fi, they can use the resources, we might even be able to persuade them uh, to put some input into our other courses. We might also persuade them to start up some new courses in digital, you know, as teachers of digital and stuff like that. So, I, you know, I think it's not, it's an issue about paradigm, as you've heard me go on before about paradigms and thinking at the moment, the policy, the FE policy is still driven by people with a mindset and paradigm that's predicated on the post-industrial revolution way in which the colleges were set up. It's ironic that, it, that the whole further education skills workforce development agenda is now being driven by a government by government and employers when in the start, in the beginning of it, the history of it, is it wasn't those people that were very interested in it. They didn't want their workers trained because if the workers trained, they got and pissed off and worked for somebody else and they got higher and they got above the station. So, you know, the history of further and adult education is predicated on workers themselves saying, uh, actually, I want to improve, I want to do this. And so the Mechanics Institute, the Workers' Education Associations, uh, the trade unions were the ones who stimulated learning. The state and employers actually did it. Well, there were some enlightened employers, you know, the Salts and the Cadbury, the Bourne Bills and, you know, one or two others. But predominantly, it wasn't, it wasn't the big employers that said, we need to do more training. It was the workers that said, we need to improve our skills, you know, and everything like that. So th th there's this sort of rich irony here now, which is that now, uh, because the state funds it uh, predominantly and the employers have got used to the state subsidising and funding it, then they've got a bigger say in it. So, uh, but the good news from a Feltag point of view is uh, I am confident that the messages of Feltag are now being built into the design process and the criteria that will be used to uh, redesign then reshape uh, the new further education landscape. So it, it makes it even more true that my tweet, those FE providers who embrace the spirit of Feltag will not only survive but thrive. That's, that's absolutely even sharper in focus now because, you know, if, if you were sitting as, as a chair or on the board of an area review, and you've got eight, nine, ten providers, and you know a couple of those providers have got a fantastic Wi-Fi infrastructure. They've got a workforce uh, that's capable of delivering learning and supporting and assessing learning, you know, using digital technologies. My guess is they'll probably be able to do that for a larger number of students uh, with a different model of teaching and learning. And you've got to decide whether you should carry on funding them or provider B down the road who is still very much in analog mode, who doesn't hasn't invested in the digital infrastructure, as a workforce that's still predominantly face to face uh, skilled rather than online or blended skilled, then you know it's not it's not rocket science is it to say, well, you know, given the scarce resources, if we have to fund one or the other, let me ask you this let me ask you and your and your viewers this question. What do these uh, companies have in common, okay? Nokia, Kodak, Jessup's, Woolworths, Blockbuster. Do, do I need to go on? No, you gave it away on the first one, but I won't. <laughs> now, if therefore 
uh, you know, resources are scarce. The minister sees the FB needs to be rationalised, and he's definitely talking about less providers, but but bigger providers. Um, economies of scale, then blended learning and, and, and the use of technology enhanced learning and online learning fits beautifully into all that, but only if, only if uh, the providers have got the right infrastructure, the right governance and leadership vision and the right workforce skills to be able to do it. So, so all, all, all the Feltag uh, stuff, those providers that have got on with it, starting to implement it you know and there's increasing numbers of those that are happening it's happening i'm really encouraged by it then you know i think they're in a good and strong position those providers that went all oh, right 10 percent. this is a tick box exercise um you know what we'll do is we'll subcontract out uh, the uh, english and maths to this free online thing or we'll buy this package in from uh, bksb or whoever which will co cover our 10 percent like you know i think i've missed the point and ultimately we'll we'll miss the ball but I'm, I'm quite encouraged by uh the way that the fe that the policy makers are listening because of fell tag and because of the what the sector is now telling them what we need to make sure is that the the paradigm of the people who are planning the reshape sector has the digital paradigm built into it I think the worst case scenario is uh, they carry on in the old analog paradigm and when they've sorted it all out they think right now what about technology and IT, IT will be able to, will, will be able to stuff stuff in the cloud. That's missing the point. I mean, you, you know, my, my, my grandchildren, I hope they do have an FE provider to go to, but the FE sector has to undergo some rapid Agile transformation, agile evolution, as we call it in Feltag, and that's going to mean, uh, you know, a number of changes to the workforce and the skills profile uh, of, of the workforce. Now, how that's achieved is going to be a massive challenge. So that, I mean, that that's all good news, I think, on the further education and vocational education front. Uh, I wish I could say uh, there was as good news from uh, on the schools uh, side because. As you know, uh, after Feltag, uh, Michael Gold and uh, Matthew Hancock and uh, the David Willits were the, the, the three ministers, uh, the two from Biz. And well, Hancock was in Biz and DFE, Gold was DFE. And, and they established ETAG, the Education Technology Action Group. And you can look at it, well, I'd urge you to do it, etag.report, probably the easiest URL to remember, etag.report. There's a series of about 30 odd recommendations, uh, which, you know, a group of 20 people, five or six professors, people from industry, lots of teachers got involved and made these recommendations. Uh, and, and unfortunately, they were commissioned by three ministers who then got reshuffled uh, in the last reshuffle. And uh, we've now got three new ministers. Uh, uh, Nicky Morgan, Nick Gibb, and uh, 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 Bowles, Nick Bowles in FE, who frankly do not have the same vision or le level of understanding uh, that Michael Gore and Hancock and Willits had about the potential of technology. I mean, uh, uh, Willits was very keen on to see the MOOC experiment uh, and learn lessons from that. Hancock obviously was very keen. Uh, because he could, he he would, he'd started Feltag, and he, uh, you know he wanted to see the FE sector align itself with a more digital future. So he said that actually, go eventually recognised that, and these were his words: uh, just just getting out of the way of schools and letting them do their own thing is not good enough when it comes to the area of learning technology because it moves so fast just getting out of the way is, is not a responsible government action. That what we need to do is to be able to uh, share best practice. We need to have a vision. Michael Gove, uh, much to my uh, you know, amazement, four years into government, saying, uh, well, we got it wrong when it comes to learning technology because we scrapped Vector. Fair enough, we agree with that. You know, we, we scrapped ring fence, but we did all that because they're, they're 
ideological belief is the state should take a back seat when it comes to decisions about education and training, and that should be very much down to the professionals. But he had the good grace to recognize that in this space of learning technology, the pace of change and the, and the importance of our ability to respond to it was so great that uh, government does have a role and does have a need to intervene, particularly when, because um, if, if you just let the, set, let the schools do what they want to do, that's all very well for those schools who have the vision and the leadership and the resources to, to do it. But those that don't or won't, then they're going to get left behind. So at least he recognised that. Now the dilemma is, and they set up and they wanted advice to do it. The recommendations are there, but we've got a new set of ministers in who, frankly, I'm not sure quite understand it, even if they did understand it. I'm not sure they're that bothered. So, whereas on the further education front, I'm really, really much more positive because of stuff that's going on both on the ground and at policy level. Uh, when it comes to the school's agenda, there's some great practice going on. Some of the head teachers that are on, that were on ETAG, you know, the leading visionaries, uh, are, are, are really pushing ahead with that. But it's in a policy vacuum, it, you know, and, and no, nobody wants to go back to the national strategy days, Martin. I don't, I don't think people want to go back to the big quango, uh, top-down. Uh, Frameworks. Oh, we dare do this because Vector says we, we, you know, I don't think anybody wants to go back to those days and we don't need to go back to those days. But it would be helpful if government, even if they just said a few words now and again of encouragement to say mm. technology is a big part. But, but I'm afraid whether it's because of ideology or what, I don't know what it is or whether it's afraid of what the Daily Mail might say, um, uh, you know, when it comes to using mobile technology in classrooms. Or whether it's just a personal uh, prejudice that the schools minister Nick Gibb has against anything uh, that isn't in a book, um, you know. So it, for for me, it's bittersweet at the moment. It's it's sweet because FE have listened, uh, the policymakers listened. Uh, some stuff's happening. Uh, it's happening on the ground, and there's an opportunity for us to for the for the for the technology people to be able to influence the debate and the reshaping of the FE sector. I'm not, you know, that, that's the sweet bit. The bittersweet is there's 35 recommendations from a really talented group of people who spent their own time over six months coming up with these recommendations. And just to refresh your memory, those recommendations were uh, come under three headings and I chaired what I thought was the most important group, which was the group concerned with connectivity, access and equity. The second group was leadership and professional development and it's obviously about teachers and teaching. And, and the third group was assessment and accountability, all chaired by different people, worked over time. Now, I, I do believe my group was the most important group because there's a massive equity issue at stake here. It, it cannot be right that a child in the school down the road here in Manchester that has super fast broadband and a teacher who understands the power of technology and has the confidence to embrace it and use it for learning, uh, will the children attending that school have a tremendous, and, and who may or may not have super fast broadband at home and parents who uh, you have got three or four devices and da 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 and another child in rural Cumbria or rural Norfolk that doesn't have any, doesn't, that the school, one, doesn't have the connectivity, two, therefore, won't have the teachers because they've never had any practice in it. So the, there's a massive equity issue at stake here. And if we're not careful, and as you and I know, technology is fantastic as a catalyst. It can either accelerate or it can slow down. Now, my view is the achievement gap, if we're not careful, we'll work, the achievement gap will never be narrowed unless we do some intervention because, uh, you know, whereas before the, the best predictor of a child's 
um, development at school and achievement was how many books the parents have got at home. Now it's got to be how many devices, what the broadband connectivity is. And, and I think there is a role for government to ensure that all children have equal access to the world of learning and knowledge that the internet provides. So, so in, in summary then, uh, since the last time I talked to you, good progress in further education, massive reshaping, I think there's going to be enormous implications for the workforce in FE, uh, but you know, I've been, we've been telling them that for some time now. Uh, schools, uh, less so. Higher education, well they do their own thing anyway, there's not a lot you can tell them in higher education because they know it all anyway, don't they? If you want some evidence base for the connectivity issue, look at the last BESA study, the last uh, the British Education Suppliers Association, which looked at you know connect, which got which has got all the stats and everything like that. You can get it, go Google it on their website, and it's scary. It's scary that you know there are still mm. you know thousands and thousands of education schools, mainly schools, mainly primary schools now. Secondary is getting better, further is getting better. Higher is pretty good anyway because they've got the investment and they've got, you know, they've got the money. But primary schools, connectivity, I mean, <laughs> and in some respects, it's a metaphor for, uh, you know, years gone by where some had access to schools and some didn't. You know, because of poverty or whatever, they couldn't afford to go to school. Well, it's only the same issue now. You, you know, we're being denied the access to the world of learning. For two, for two reasons. One, connectivity, but secondly, you might not have the teachers who are capable of using the connectivity that you do have. So, you know, that's a double, that's a double one. Yeah, the world of learning, that's a good phrase, because, you know, when you get connected to the internet, you are connected to the world. And uh, absolutely. Is you know, it, is, it isn't a simple thing about just throwing some technology at people, is it? It's, you know, if, if, if it was only that, you know, that... Uh, it's not, it's much more, common. and in fact the technology is not really the issue. The two and I are here having this conversation, rich conversation as it is, uh, uh, with a piece of software that's universally available, that's free, that anybody can use. Anyway, you know, any schools and colleges that are not taking advantage of the Google offer at the moment, they must be crazy. You know, why, why would you want to invest in big learning platforms or uh, or uh, uh, you know, big video conferencing things. All, all this is free, you know. So, and our access to each other, and therefore the world. I mean, I'm I'm sat on the uh, I sit on the board of the UFI Trust, which has got 50 million pounds to give out to uh, innovative projects, and we've just approved another 16. And I'm not going to give any confidences away of who's got approved or what. But there's one one little project. Yes, I think. I, I mean. If I had some money, I'd buy shares in it because, and, and you grasp this as a great idea, what it is is, is the proposal, well, they've already got a prototype to develop it and refine it, is a, uh, a way of uh, searching existing MOOCs all over the world, so whether it's Stanford, MIT. So let's say you might be interested in... Uh, a particular part of marine biology. So, you know, let's say you're interested in uh, mollusks and something, something, something. Uh, this this tool will allow you to put that into the search engine and it will find you all the MOOCs that are available for free from all over the world that are related to that specific topic. It will grade them according to their level of difficulty and challenge and whether they've got qualifications associated with them and then it will do an assessment for you to say okay well what's your level of understanding and knowledge at this moment in time and then when you've done the initial assessment it'll say well look this is the best one that's for you wow. now now think about that in the context of what you're trying to do with your little project yeah, this is this is amazing. I mean, that, a few years ago, Bob, I remember this conversation coming up when MOOCs were on the rise and the endless existential challenges to FE, you know, what we're going to do, maybe we can work around MOOCs, uh, maybe we can, you know, advise students on, you know, which, which MOOCs would suit their needs. We don't have to 
te we don't have to deliver it, but we can be, you know, enablers, facilitate. Well, there's a product now. There's a, yeah. a system that's doing exactly that. Uh, we, we mustn't fall into this false dichotomy, which, as you said, the existentialists put forward, which is it's either or. Oh, what what about what about the learners who don't want to learn online? Well, I. I have to say, Martin, I have yet to come across any who don't want to who don't want to augment or further refine or replace their current face to face. Let me give you an example. Fifteen years ago, uh, I went to sign on at Sheffield College to do beginners guitar uh, one night a week, seventy pounds it cost me for the term. Yeah. Yeah. To learn with a group of other, take my own guitar, learn with a group of other people. Now, where's the best place that I could possibly learn guitar today? Oh yeah, you. YouTube. Mm. Because not only can I can learn from Bruce Springsteen or whoever you know, uh, Steve Earle or you know whoever whoever motivates me, whoever I like listen to, I can I can go on YouTube, I can see the chords. Uh, I can watch him play it, I can practice doing it, and if I get it wrong, I can go back and do it again. Now, t t tell me that isn't a better way of learning how to do something than going out on a cold December night. <laughs> now, it's not either or, because I still want to play with other people, and therefore I can invite some other people around to my house or I can go around to other people's house and we can play together and learn from each other. The point that I'm making is the technology is a massively disruptive force and I think some people in education have recognised the potential of that disruption, both positive and negative, and are doing something about it, and some haven't. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a very few things that you need to go into a college building for now, aren't there? I mean, there's some physics and chemistry and some building stuff but a lot of what we do I don't know 80% of it you know we, you can be distributed can't it you don't have to go in to a lab you know um, I agree I agree and, and 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 even you know just you mentioned the lab thing uh, that, that some some of the simulations you see now you know some of the work in medical and dentistry and um, you, you know uh, biological simulations where you know I mean wh when you and I were studying you were lucky if you got a plastic model of an eye well you know with the technology now you can actually you know you can probably go inside the eye and have a look round and everything like that you know I remember when I was teaching uh, uh, biology you know where we used to bring in the uh, uh, the pig's hearts and cut them open and everything like that and, oh Jesus you know it was awful you know and you couldn't get away with it these days but I mean, there's no need to do that now because there are simulations, you know, you think of some, I mean, and that leads me on to the, the whole issue of games-based learning. Right. You know, the potential that there is in for, for games-based learning, which I, I don't think uh, the FE sector or the education sector has even begun to tap into. And virtual reality as well, you know, the, the rise in, in VR. I, well, I, I, th these kids, these kids, these kids are going to be used to augmented and virtual reality, uh, wearable computers, uh, you know, everything stored in the cloud, accessible anytime, any place, and, and virtual and augmented reality will be part. Well, to be honest, it's part of some people's lives already, isn't it? You know, you, you, you've seen the Oculus Rift and the potential that that's got now. The direction of travel is obvious, Martin. But what? Why does it take so people so obvious, so long to to, to see it? What? What? I, I don't understand. You know, it's true. I, I I had to go at Oculus Rift about six months ago. I went into a, 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 a an operating theatre. You know, and you get you get get the um, ear pieces on, you get the, mm. the uh, eyepiece on, and it's completely immersive. In fact, you know, I thought I'd better come out here because. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I've lost track of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Well, well, there's there's a, there's a company called Caspian Learning. I, I, you know, and I, I have to say, I, I think 
there is tremendous potential and opportunity for the private sector organisations. I don't, I don't mean the tribals and the Pearsons of the world. I'm talking about small, but you know, companies that are producing augmented virtual reality products and then aligning themselves, let's say, with a, a sector skills council or a big employer to develop simulations. I'm seeing lots more and more of them. I mean, and just just think, for example, I mean, some of the Ministry of Defence simulation training that goes on. Because when, when you're training somebody to drive a, a submarine, you really don't want them to learn uh, by getting it wrong and crashing a nuclear submarine, do you? So, you know, some of those simulations, and and if if we're honest, you know, most of the games that have cut, you know, World of Warcraft and all that stuff actually came out of training uh, designed for the American Ministry of Defense, you know. So... What, what just makes it difficult for me is to understand why why is it that education seems so cocooned from the rest of uh, what's happening in, in our world? Yeah, it's complicated, isn't it? That's one of the slides I had on a um, talk I did at BET a few years ago. You know, IT, it's complicated, sometimes on purpose. Because yeah, there's, yeah. There's, there's a whole ecosystem around the big platforms with consultancy support. You know, it's all a nice little nice money earner. Which you, I'm not a fan of the big 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 platforms. What I liked what you're saying though, it's, it's to remind me of that is it's not a binary decision. It's not you know education does tend to go into this one thing or the other, and then it goes health and leather in one direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Having a balanced approach, you know. And I think I think that you, you, you I think you what did you call them existentialists you know but I mean I, I do lots of presentations and workshops in schools and colleges and everything like that and you can see you know the people who sit at the front like that you know going go on then convince me you know, and, uh, about this and, and immediately it's their first line of defence which is ah oh, well uh, you, you know so what you're saying is that, that we know human contact and everything like that. well that's rubbish on two counts. One, uh, we're having human contact now, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 you know, and all right, it's maybe not the same as you sat in the chair here because I could have get up and make a cup of tea or just go and sit out in the garden and I'd had to, but, but it's human contact and we're having a conversation and, you know, technology uh, enabled. Well, it's but it's not writing to each other all day, you know, with email and just text, it's much more natural. Absolutely, or sending us a letter, or or you know, if we want to be get into really Nick Gibb form, I could I could write something on the wall here behind me and wait till you came up and looked at it, couldn't I? Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, you know how far how far do we want to go back? Or you know, or I could go and get some reeds out of the garden, mash them all together, and write something in uh, you know ink, just, ink and, and scroll right. Write it up and seal it, and then put it on a horse and send it down to you. I could do that if you want. Yeah, actually, but what you mentioned there is, is, is I've, I'm, I'm quite, I'm quite impressed by the way video, YouTube in particular, is changing some of the ways we communicate. You know, especially in practical trades. You know, yeah. and the kids are coming to you know, reading about it and seeing pictures, maybe. But when you can see it demonstrated, just as you were saying earlier, you know, you yeah. can, you can watch someone play guitar. You know, anything which is practical, it, it's been usurped by the written word so much, and so is education. And this kind of frees it up a lot, especially performance arts, practical. Well, let me illustrate. Yeah, exactly. Let me illustrate that. I, I mean, the resistance I get from. Uh, well, I get resist. I, I mean, I always get resistance anyway, and I, and I love it really because the more resistance I get, the more it fuels and, and feeds me. Because one, I know I'm right, and two, I've got history on my side, haven't I? You know the way things are going. Uh, but but a classic example is you know a bunch of uh, FE teachers under you know and uh, and I I doing all my stuff about how we can use Skype and. Uh, Google Plus and uh, da, 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 Twitter and everything like that. And uh, the plumbing lecturer will get up, and the plumbing lecturer, oh, it's all very well, or the motor vehicle mechanic, or you know, another practically based thing. Now, and they'll say, ah, well, you can't teach bricklaying on video. Well, actually, you can. You can. And if you just go into YouTube and Google basic construction techniques, and it's full of stuff. Now, now, all right, 
you're not getting the practical ability to do it there and then. But that's where the blend comes in, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. But at, at this moment in time, I would argue that a lot of what goes on within the glass palaces and the half empty buildings with the teachers stood at the front is, as you've just described, practical skills being converted into underpinning knowledge, which is delivered in a way that could be delivered much better uh, in, in another format. And so the, the key question is, right, we've got these really expensive buildings and space and expensively trained teachers. What is it? Uh, that we need to do when we bring people together face to face. But it's not just the expense of the building, it's the expense of the people coming, traveling, the time, the opportunity cost for them and what else they could have been doing. What, could, what do we need to be able to do to make the best use of that time and space and person to person interaction? And if it, what other stuff can be done better in a different format? In other words, I mean, this is the flip classroom model isn't it which you're familiar with you know if we've got those people for example let's take my guitar lesson for example uh 15 years ago there's no point in me going to a guitar lesson and then uh, the te teacher going through stuff on the blackboard you know if i'm going to be going with the guitar i want to be playing and everything like that so if, if nowadays the teacher could email me the week before or we could we could the class could even be on google hangouts and in my little message box comes, uh, right, before tomorrow's class, what I would like you to do is watch this YouTube video and practice the chords on this particular song. And when we come tomorrow night, we'll be doing a group practice of this and we'll be playing together. And then we'll be, you'll be watching somebody else and you'll be coaching somebody else. So it's about taking the best of both, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and you, yeah, with YouTube. One of my, one of the things that I, I'm also impressed with, when if you on YouTube you look at cover versions, uh, people, yeah. you know, people endless cover versions of people yeah, yeah. in their bedroom or their kitchen playing. You know, yeah, yeah, exactly. most um, like Steve Vai is one of my favourite guitarists. I don't know if you know him, but it's very technical. You know, fast technical thing. How do people play that? You know, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Some fourteen year There's a Yazzie, she's called. Uh, I think she was fourteen or thirteen or something when she started. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. This stuff. It's well, incredible. Well, I, I'm just you know using a, an example uh, in the vocational education sector. You know, but some of the fan, there's some fantastic resources there on hairdressing and yeah. uh, catering and stuff like that. But, you know, there's a few colleges now have created their own iTunes library yeah. uh, and they're doing stuff like that. Uh, you know, but you have to pay. To do that, but I mean, I think you can you could do that anyway, couldn't you? And, and create. Yeah. So I think what we're, we're both saying is, um, you know, the ed the education sector uh, variable movements, but it's so constrained by the regulatory framework, the assessment, the Ofsted, the inspections. Uh, the paradigm is still stuck in that uh, post-industrial mechanized Tayloristic factory process consumption where yeah yeah that that's not using technology for learning that you know uploading or or even you know podcasts and talking heads and everything like that the power for learning in, in digital technology is the other c's content is one but the other c's are collaboration communication co-creation co-construction creativity they're they're all collaborate. They're, they're all the, the powerful seeds where learning takes place. The idea that technology enhanced learning is all oh, the teachers uploaded a Word document and I have to look at it and read it and answer the questions and send it back by email tomorrow. I mean, that's just missing the point. Yeah, a lot. Yeah, you've you've answered a, a question right at the beginning there because a lot of colleges that aren't embracing the spirit of Feltag, that is their response. Um, it's a lot of content just uploaded. You know. Tick in the box. Um, context is another one. Steve Wheeler, you know. Uh, says, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, says context trumps uh, content. Um, Absolutely. The, the collaboration thing as well. Back to I suppose YouTube and that kind of thing. Co-creation is um, where students. I, I saw this in develop uh, on a project with developing nations that um, they can watch dance, yeah, and yeah. then you get 
the kids in China riff on it a bit, you know, and add yeah, a little yeah, yeah. more, and then some yeah, kids yeah. over in Africa add a bit more, and the whole thing, you know, takes off, is, is added to, instead of, you know, this one, you know, one epitomizing example which everybody consume. Here, yeah, you know, that, yeah that's, the, that's the co-creation thing and the ownership thing as well. But what you've just triggered in my mind is uh, another thing that's not co-creation, but it's the power of digital technology. Last Christmas, my wife bought me a, a voucher for, this is before my, my knees that went, for uh, 10 golf lessons and uh, down at the local uh, driving range here in uh, Trafford. And, uh, you know, I went along, and I, 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 I've always stood around, and I'm no good at it, so in fact, I'm going to give it up, because I'm not getting any better. But, but she, she, she bought me these lessons, and I went along. I'll tell you what, it, it was absolutely fantastic how, how the guy used the technology. You know, so I go up, he says, right, go up there, get the club, do a few swings. You know, there's video, he's got three video cameras uh, that are taking me. You know, I'm doing my swing, and he says, right, okay, come back, sit down here, and he's got it, he's recorded, and he says, now look at this, and look at this, and look at this. And then what he does, he brings a, a Tiger Woods swing, and he shows me a Tiger, and he drag, drags me across and drops me onto Tiger Woods, oh. and shows and shows how Tiger Woods, and he shows mine. And then he says, right, now go back on and try and do that. So he does all that, and then... We have the lesson, and, and I get home. He got the email address. By the time I got back home, he'd sent me the, all the videos that he'd just taken of me doing it and everything like that, and with some with six or seven key learning points and some key practice points that I needed to do before I went back the next lesson. Now, if 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 a golf pro can do that, a trained teacher can do that. Well, I suppose better wrap this up, I suppose, and uh, I've got yeah, a lot of yeah, yeah. to do. I've got a lot the of it. The sun's still out, and I need to go and get a cup of tea, but yeah. it's, always, it's always a pleasure.